Hello, everybody. Welcome to our in-person and virtual audience. I know there are a lot of people watching um, virtually tonight. Um, I'm Amy McDonald, director of WBUR City Space. It's thundering and lightning. I think people will be trickling in um, throughout the program tonight. Uh, Temple Gill, who um, she uh, oh, there you are. Uh, who handles public affairs and partnerships for the Huntington Theater uh, and whom I've worked with for years. She called me just a couple of weeks ago and proposing that we have a conversation at City Space about the issues of slavery and the consequential historic economic disparities that are not directly addressed in the Lehman Trilogy. I thought it was an important conversation to be had and so apparently did all of you. To help put these issues into context, we are joined by Kiara Singleton, the Executive Director of the Royal House and Slave Quarters in Medford, and Steve, Steve Whitfield, Professor Emeritus at Brandeis University, whose specialty is political and cultural history, as well as American Jewish history. Leading the conversation is WBUR's arts and culture reporter, Cristela Guerra, who we are about to lose to Harvard University, where she will begin her one-year Neiman Fellowship. <laughs> if you have questions for our panel, please go to slido.com and type in hashtag Lehman, Lehman. We will be taking your questions throughout the hour. Before I turn it over to Christella, I, want, I welcome to the stage Huntington's artistic director, Charles Hogland, and the community engagement manager, Oz Pereira, who will say a bit about their production and introduce a brief clip from last night's production. Welcome. Hi, good evening. I'm Charles Hoagland. Amy just gave me a promotion. Um, I am actually the director of new work at the Huntington Theater Company. And I'm Oz Pereira, community engagement manager. As per race. <laughs> The play, The Lehman Trilogy, has been a worldwide success. It was written starting in 2008 by author Stefano Massini in Italy. He said that following the collapse of Lehman Brothers, he became interested in the social and cultural dimensions that money plays in the everyday. He said, I wrote it because I was convinced that if we can understand man's relationship with money, we as individuals who must deal with money every day can live our lives more fully. The play toured Europe in Italian and has then been translated into more than a dozen languages. For the English translation, it was condensed to three and a half hours for a British production by Ben Power. That production, directed by Sam Mendes, toured to New York and Los Angeles, won the Tony Award for Best Play, and ignited public conversation at every step. The Huntington is now staging the American production of this play. And we believe that Boston is uniquely centered here to provide space and opportunity to have these conversations. We at the Huntington believe that we shared a core civic belief with our community. And that's what allows us to have these conversations about history that actually matters. The Lehman Trilogy follows the rise and fall of both the Lehman family and the Lehman Corporation, sub simultaneously intimate and epic. Tonight, we're starting with a clip from last night's performance of the play, our first preview. In it, you'll see Stephen Sky Bell, who ap appears as Henry Lehman, one of three actors in the play, alongside Joshua David Robinson and Fredus Bomji. He had been dreaming of America. The son of a cattle merchant, a circumcised Jew with only one piece of luggage, stood as still as a telegraph pole on dock number four in the port of New York. Thank God he'd arrived, Baruch Hashem. Thank God he'd left, Baruch Hashem. Thank God he is now finally in America. Baruch Hashem. Children yelling the creak of metal and squeak of pulleys. And in the midst of it all, there he is, silent still, just off the boat, wearing his best shoes. 
the ones he'd never worn, <laughs> the ones he'd kept in storage for that moment when I will be in America. And here it is, that moment, immortalized by the cast iron clock up high on the port tower, 25 minutes past seven. He takes a pencil from his pocket and a small black notebook. He writes seven and 25 and notices his hand tremble. Maybe it's the emotion or maybe after a month and a half at sea, just standing still on dry land, not rocking. It's strange. He'd lost 10 pounds and grown a thick beard as thick as a rabbi's on the 45 days crossing. 45 days spent moving up and down between cot, birth, and bow, bow, birth, and cot. He left La Havre, a teetotaler, and got off the boat in New York, an expert drinker. <laughs> Able to recognize from the first sip, brandy from rum, gin from cognac, English ale from Irish stout. <laughs> he left La Havre, ignorant of gambling, and got off the boat in New York, a champion at cards and dice. <laughs> he left shy, self-absorbed and arrived convinced he understood the world. The irony of the French, the temper of the Spanish, the angry, pouting pride of the Italian cabin boys. He left with an idea of America in his head and got off the boat with America before him, no longer in his mind, but there in front of his eyes. America! Baruch Hashem! So, that's the Lehman Trilogy. That's a little clip there. When we were preparing to produce this play at our theater, we had deep and intense conversations around this play, right? There's a lot of complex issues surrounding um, issues of race, uh, issues of um, social and religious dynamics within the play that take part, not only what you see on stage, but also the historical context that surrounds this play, right? What does it mean that the Lehmans profited off the institution of slavery? What does it mean that the Lehmans themselves own slaves, right? What does it mean for us to put on a show at this time of uh, about Jewish financiers in an age of swelling anti-Semitism all around the world. And how did the Lehman shape American capitalism to what is today, right? Uh, the story of the Lehmans is not divorced from the story of America itself, right? America itself and the, the capitalist system is founded within slavery, founded within oppressing and f the forced labor of black women, men, and children. The artists in the rehearsal room have included a microcosm of our community. The range of backgrounds includes devout Jewish artists, black artists, international citizens, and local residents. And our hope is that as you, the greater Boston community, come to see this play, you too will ask deep and profound questions about it. And uh, I know that we will also um, hear some of those questions tonight with our distinguished panel. So, yeah, without further ado, what, first I'd like to thank WBR for allowing us to host this space. Um, and I'd like to throw it over to WBR's senior arts and culture reporter, uh, Cristela Guerra. Can I get a round of applause? Thank you both so much. Um, I always say this, Amy knows this, I'm always honored to be on this stage. Um, I'm always so excited to lead a conversation and it's never enough time. I don't just, we have an hour, like, we, the play is three and a half hours. <laughs> like, how many people actually saw it? Okay. So we're, um, we have experts on it. We also have experts on the context of it. And um, I very much want to focus and begin opening on the silences of it because there's so much, I happened to see it last night. Um, and in reading some of the work of our distinguished guest um, and sort of understanding, I cover race and identity um, within the arts and culture team, sort of using arts and culture as a lens to get at this. So this play was intriguing 
um, very much also because they mentioned that the Lehmans funded the Panama Canal and I myself am, Pan am Panamanian. Um, and part of my Lehman Fellowship is looking into the history of US imperialism in Panama. So you color me shocked <laughs> when suddenly they're like, oh, you know where we should put our money. So um, I'm really intrigued. I'm intrigued to go into both, uh, if, if you could both speak to, this is also in the program, so when you see it, please read the, the context that they include in the program, because it's fascinating. But what's erased, um, aside from, from their names? Which, I mean, I myself am, am an immigrant, but all three brothers, when they, when they arrive, almost immediately, uh, at some point, change aspects of themselves. And then they change associations of their wealth. Um, what's, what's, what are the silences for you, Kiera? I think for me, one of the things um, that really stood out is that while they talk about accumulating wealth, while they talk about where they are, you know, investing in cotton, tobacco, coffee, essentially what happens is that um, the people who are doing that labor, who's picking that cotton, who is, you know, on the sugar uh, cane plantation, who's on the uh, coffee plantations, the tobacco plantations, they do not actually figure into um, the play at all. And so that's one of the things that immediately stood out to me. The other thing that stood out to me um, that I think I struggled with um, originally was the fact that um, the play doesn't really engage with the fact that they too are enslavers. So they're not just profiting off of um, uh, selling and trading um, goods that are manufactured from uh, plantations. But in 1854, we know that uh, Henry Lehman purchased a young black woman um, named Martha uh, for $900. So within the first decade of him moving um, to um, Montgomery, he is also an enslaver. And then his younger brother, um, actually enslaves about seven people. And so that is a very fascinating um, part of the story that just does not factor into the play. And I think it's really important to think about the people um, who are behind their wealth um, and that they're not just engaging and selling you know, items at a dry goods school store or um, selling uh, cotton to the North, but they too um, are participating in the buying selling, um, and trading of enslaved people. Yeah, first of all, I thank you for this invitation to participate in this program and to note that um, since one of the claims for the pertinence of the Lehman Trilogy has to do with the, the contemporary rise of anti-Semitism, it's striking to me that part one, which is really uh, the part that's set in the antebellum South, is virtually devoid of any issue of, uh, of Judeophobia, virtually there's nothing in there that could be said to be described as anti-Semitism. This is also erased, it seems to me, in the play. And paradoxically, I believe that uh, in this case it's justified. That is, anti-Semitism is erased in antebellum Alabama because by and large it was not there. Um, there are a number of reasons for this that I can just briefly mention. One has to do with the, the white South and to some extent the black South uh, as the most pious part of the United States, already true in the antebellum period, even more true later down into the 21st century. Uh, and Jews as the people of Jesus uh, have a kind of bonus or a kind of advantage in all sorts of ways among pious Christians, particularly pious Protestants, in the attachment to what Christians call the Old Testament, in the ways by which the New Testament springs from, uh, the, springs from the Jewish people. But also, and perhaps in, in a very obvious way, there's minimal anti-Semitism in the, in the South because there are so very, very few Jews. And uh, Jews were not particularly attracted to the region. Uh, and therefore, they pose no particular threat to uh, those who had power and privilege. And then finally, and again, perhaps very obviously, there's minimal anti-Semitism, precisely because Jews are generally perceived as white. Uh, there's a change later in the 19th century, well after the Lehmans have already gone to New York, uh, but certainly in the antebellum period before the development of a kind of ideological racism in the late 19th century. 
basically Jews are on the side of the color line that has the advantages of, of privilege and power. And therefore, um, there's no particular reason to treat uh, Jews with the kind of hostility that is directed so pervasively uh, against enslaved people in that era and, of course, later to uh, black Southerners. Um, I want to make sure that before I, I go on that I welcome those who are watching online um, and also invite all of you to participate with us. I think um, these conversations are, more, are better when you engage. Um, I never want to feel... Like I'm talking at folks, I want you to feel like you can participate, especially if something sparks your interest or if you have thoughts after watching the play because I, I feel like I could have talked about it all evening. It just it brought a lot of things to the surface. So we'll get your questions up here and we'll definitely get them answered. So please, you know, contribute. Um, where do I want to go from here? I'm like, do, you know, do I want to start at the beginning or do I want to go in reverse in time a bit? Because right now we're dealing in a moment where um, I, I mentioned to them other last names, you know, the Sacklers come to mind when we're talking about last names that are associated with wealth that are seen on galleries, but then are also then held to account for actions. So what are we seeing, I guess, Kara, could we get into sort of the conversation around like, people would say, this was such a long time ago. And then the Lehman Corp, like there was, it was the ascent and the dis descent, right? It was the fall of an empire that we actually witnessed on this stage. Um, is that enough? Is that in and of itself recompense? Um, and I think when we were talking earlier, you said people, people tell you what about the Lehmans? You know, I think what's fascinating is that there is a way in which um, we like to consider, you know, people who do quite terrible things as a product of their time. And I, I like to push back against that because it's pretty calculated. They know what they're doing. Um, they have other options and they choose um, to make the decisions that um, they make. But I, I think, you know, it's, it's not enough. And it's not enough because when we're thinking about how communities have been under-resourced, you have to follow the money. And when you follow the money, it is very clear the time Type of um, systemic, you know, racism and inequities that still exist today because of actions um, from corporations like the the Lehman Brothers. And so, you know, if we're thinking about the fact that you know these brothers, you know, they believe that they're pulling themselves up by the bootstraps, it's the American dream. Well, I like to say, well, American dream for whom, right? Because if their American dream is built on terror for other people, then we have to interrogate that a little bit more. More importantly, um, it's, it's easy to think about their fall and their descent, but not think about the human cost to the people um, whose lives they destroyed actually in the process while building their wealth. And so I think that we have to hold both of those together. Um, and until there's like some very real reparations going on, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure just their rise and fall is enough because, you know, the Lehmans, you know, still quite wealthy, actually. Their family, their descendants. Um, we can't say the same thing um, about the people who, you know, they enslaved in Alabama or, you know, the black and indigenous people on the plantations in Haiti and Brazil where, you know, they're farming, um, where they're picking um, uh, coffee beans um, uh, or the, you know, black West Indian laborers who were forced to work on the Panama Canal. Um, so I think that there's an accounting that has to be done. Yeah, I'm, I, I may be in some disagreement here with Kiera about the, the issue of, uh, of agency, because from my reading of the play, and I'm handicapped by not seeing the play yet, what's striking to me is uh, a, a kind of... Um, both, as we saw in the clip, an extraordinary exuberance about the opportunities that America provided, that is the genuine thrill and excitement of arriving in America, the sense, in other words, which I think is at least partly conveyed in the clipping that we saw, that there's a kind of uh, liberation from all the limitations that Jewish life um, uh, had in Bavaria and elsewhere in, in the German provinces and states. What were some of those limitations, if you don't mind me asking? I'm sorry. Yeah, what? the limitations were Jews could not generally own land. Uh, the feudal system was basically one that prevented any sort of land ownership, which was very often the source of wealth, which drives Jews into the limited professions that Christians did not dominate. 
the uh, the craft system, uh, the crafts also basically excluded Jews. So that is why the Jews historically went into areas like uh, like trade and like money lending. So this is something that um, America offers them at least a, a kind of uh, sense of autonomy that they would never have known in early 19th century uh, German states. And so here, uh, and this is perhaps why I, I would disagree, at least partly with what Kiera just said, you have here people who don't realize or don't think that they in fact have any choices in dealing with the, the system of caste and the system of slavery that they find themselves in. They are desperate to succeed. They start off, it's very clear, they start off impoverished. Uh, and they rise through all sorts of um, canny, shrewd maneuvering and understanding of a system. They're not plantation owners, but they benefit, obviously, from it. But what strikes me about what I have read about the play and what I think can be um, adequately conveyed, perhaps, on stage is the sense that, uh, at least for the first generation, there's no particular sense that they have any real uh, options, any real choices, except to succeed as fully and as effectively as they can to escape uh, the, the boundaries of poverty. And that the, the pathos here is that they operate within a system of extraordinary cruelty uh, without them themselves being particularly conscious about it. I think all enslavers are conscious of um, the cruelty that they're engaging in. And so I, I, I do understand what you mean in terms of, you know, they come, they have, you know, they have a dream to build their wealth, but at what cost? There is a great accumulation, and it's always more and more and more and more. It's never quite enough. And it goes from a dry goods, a dry goods store to enslaving people to moving to the north, becoming a bank in which you're trading cotton that is, you know, picked by black people and then, you know, sent north in which they're building a ton of wealth. Um, and then that cotton, you know, gets turned into things like slave cough and sent back down south. And so they, at, at some point they could have stopped. At what point is enough wealth enough? At what point do you decide that, okay, maybe something is wrong with what I'm doing. In fact, what we see in the play is that it's never enough. It's always what is the next scheme that can make us wealthier and wealthier and wealthier. And it's not just based in the US. I mean, it's a global system that they're operating in. And so at, again, you know, I, I want to... I want to hold, you know, both of the, you know, um, uh, points that you're making that they're coming into a different system and they're allowed um, to have more access to in America to building wealth and owning land, but at the expense of people who cannot build um, wealth or own land and who are considered property. And so I don't know. I, I feel like that makes me uncomfortable a bit. Mm. Um, context of and spoilers. For those who actually haven't seen the play, we're talking three acts that span over a century that begin pre-Civil War um, with uh, a lot of moments where, and it's historical fiction obviously, but moments where the Lehmans are shown generationally. So you're moving from the three originals and then into their sons and their grandsons. And at points, there are pivot points which are really interesting in the form of dreams that they have prior to some of the most major catastrophes in US history. So pre, well for them first it was a fire that then moved them, moments of crisis that moved them into other forms of wealth making that initially seem like a loss and they view as an opportunity, which we discuss, are they sympathetic characters? Because you're almost in some ways, um, excited for them. You're almost in some ways pushing them forward to succeed because initially they are the underdog. But then civil war comes. Um, and at that point in the play, it doesn't note that they are people who own people. So uh, the youngest was in fact an enslaver. And Charles, you said that in the, the longer version, it does delve into him a lot. Yeah, what what I was talking about was there's um so uh, Stefano Messini's written several versions of this. There's the five hour original Italian, and then he's also written a book which um it, it, I listened to the audiobook version of it. It's about thirteen hours long, <laughs> and um 
uh, in that they he actually goes quite in depth into Meyer's identity as a slave owner. And one of the things that he really talks about is that um, there's this period in which they're trying to get more and more plantations to sign on to um, selling cotton to them. And the way that they do that is through hosting dinners that are cooked by Meyer slaves. And so that, that way in which um, his status as a slave owner made the creation of the corporation possible, I think is highlighted in that, in that sort of expanded version in a different way. He also sides with the Confederate Army, too. Like, yeah. um, So there's also this other part of the history that's not necessarily in the play in which um, they are very much so Confederates. Well, and, and so um, Emmanuel, the brother that moves to the North earlier, is also funding the Union troops. And I think one of the things you were talking about, and perhaps you would expand on, is that complication of the way that money is created in the South comes to the North and how that sort of feeds itself. Do you want to delve into that? And then I can... There's a question here for you, Charles, but I'll, I'll address ah! these things first. <laughs> oh, no, I just think that, you know, it's fascinating to think about... We often think about... Um, uh, people on plantations and, you know, the black women, men and children who are doing this labor. But what happens in the North is that, you know, people in the North like to just distance themselves from the history of slavery because it's not the South. But looking at cotton and how it moves, it becomes really important in this play that cotton becomes a way for them to um, move their business uh, to the north. And what you see is you see the brothers going uh, to places like uh, New York and bargaining for cotton prices. And what we know is that places like in Massachusetts, like Lowell, um, you know, they need cotton. The mills are, you know, um, in need of cotton. That cotton gets turned into things like slave cloth that cloth gets sent back um, south. Um, and that's one way that we can see how um, the money is um, kind of creating um, a circle and moving between the two regions and, and in a host of other ways as well. But that's very specific. Um, but may I just add, please. If, we, if we're talking about what's maybe erased in this play, yeah. uh, one of the things that's erased is the absence of any abolitionist movement in the south. So there's a kind of structural critique, a structural criticism that uh, it seems to me makes it extraordinarily unlikely that the Lehmans, were they as self-conscious as Kier, as you say, say they must have been, what they could have done about it. That is, uh, abolitionism was extraordinarily uh, penalized. Uh, even the circulation of abolitionist literature was something that imposed the highest kinds of penalties. So the, what I think the play is trying to suggest is that there's a structural um, difficulty that would be imposed on people even of extraordinary goodwill in terms of uh, opposition to slavery, and that the handful of whites who realize the moral um, uh, horror of slavery generally had to move north in order to basically uh, protect their lives. So it seems to me the, the play is trying in some way to suggest that um, uh, free will and autonomy are limited uh, here, even if there had been a desire to do something about the, the conditions under which the enslaved people lived. Well, and to your point, um, <clears throat> we're not even getting into like the overhanging capitalism, and capitalism then being fueled by a sort of established white supremacist system it, it naturally, you know, and so then if we're moving into Act Two, um, uh, well, just before the Great Depression, which the way it's foreshadowed is fascinating, and I think you'll really, just with the lighting and just the mood setting, where uh, it's this sort of, there's just so much hubris, um, and there's this feeling of like, well, we've made so much money, how much more money can we possibly make? So if there's no agency at first, the, gen the generations later, have a lot more. And then down the way, um, there's even this idea of a loss of, um, and St Steve, maybe we can get into this and then Charles, I'll ask you this question. But um, the, the, the Jewish values, um, there's, a, there's a sort of arc for the characters of loss of faith to a certain extent that, that even if they could have sort of reconsidered their original premise of like, why did they start a company called Lehman Brothers to begin with? They lost their way, it felt like. Um, do, you, do you have thoughts just on some of those? Yeah, I'm sort of ambivalent about it, yeah. I, have to, I have to admit. 
On the one hand, we see, and again, the clip was terrific in uh, its aptness, in that they're already losing their distinctive Jewishness on the boat coming over those 45 days. They now know how to drink. Um, they now know how to play cards. They do things that are seen to be kind of hedonistic uh, attributes that Judaic learning and Judaic life was at least in principle supposed to, um, uh, supposed to penalize. So they're, they're already Americanized by the time they land in New York, at least one of the, the, the brother is. Uh, and on the other hand, and I'm struck by this, generally speaking, the, uh, the German Jews who came to the South before the Civil War were strikingly assimilated already. Yeah. So that um, uh, the degree to which the actor is speaking in a very thick accent he keeps saying Baruch Hashem. Uh, that doesn't strike entirely true to me as the general impulse among that first generation of Jews coming to the South for whom the answer is, will, they, will we be accepted here? That answer was not yet known. Uh, so that whether Jews would be treated with any sort of equality within the white population was, was not yet a question that had been adequately answered. And therefore, the Jews who went south, and there were few in number, overwhelmingly uh, dominated, of course, by the non-Jewish population, that their desire to be included, their desire to assimilate, seems to me much greater than the kind of, uh, kind of overt and even kind of, if I may say so, theatrical Jewishness that is being depicted here. Mm. Well, and, and critiques, you know, I'll show both sides. Like, there are critiques of the play that some people feel like they sort of rely on anti-Semitic tropes, which you watch it and you decide for yourself. You disagree with that, you know? Um, it's, it's intriguing. Um, and, and, and the immigrant story of loss of culture, right, which in the United States has historically been its language, its garb. You know, what is the easiest and fastest way to assimilate is to be like those around you. And at the time, and even for my family, it was, it was whiteness. So how quickly, how quickly can you fit in and then make money and then get the house and then attain power? But then in turn, do you then decide, well, the best way to do it is by oppressing others? Or do you just naturally do it because that is sort of the American way? You know? Um, so Charles, the question for you is, how is this production different from the Broadway one? Yeah, I can absolutely uh, talk about that. So um, so this production is directed by Carrie Perloff. Carrie Perloff was the longtime uh, artistic director of American Ser Conservatory Theater in California, um, also directed um, Tom Stoppard's Rock and Roll, has a completely unique design team, a completely unique cast, um, and has been rehearsed here in Boston. Um, and so the, the questions that these artists were asking in the room are, are probably different than the questions that people were asking in the rehearsal room in London. And so I think, you know, uh, every choice of it is different other than the text. So in theater, um, uh, the text is owned by the playwright. And so um, unlike in a movie where you hear about like the director making, you know, substantial rewrites and throwing out scenes and the writer finds out in the cut here, you know, the, the, um, the creative property of the playwright is the thing that we organize ourselves around. And so that's sort of the through line between the New York production and here. Thank you. Um, audience questions, which there's only one, there've been about three, I'm very disappointed. <laughs> I, I, I have no doubt you're far more curious than this. So uh, it's slido.com. We're doing uh, hashtag Lehman. Um, please, you know, ask me things, but I also have a million other questions I could ask. Um, so the question we have now is, uh, do the brothers' grandchildren lose their Jewishness, which is a really interesting way of asking it. What does that look like? Um. It's, it's tricky because I, I believe the first generation is already losing it. So it's a matter of, of, a, of a kind of continuing declension. It's a, it's a very elusive issue. And I, I guess the, uh, for me, the most striking thing of having, again, having read the, uh, the entire play but not seen it, is I'm more struck by the fact that over the course of roughly a century, um, some core of Jewish identity is not abandoned. 
So why that is, uh, there's no evidence clearly of, for example, intermarriage as one of the indices by which we can test that. Um, there's no real explanation, as I see it, in the play itself for the continuities, which strike me as more significant than um, the degree in which acculturation is taken on a kind of pace and a kind of velocity that one would expect after two or three generations. And something else mentioned earlier that we were discussing is the Holocaust is never mentioned in the play, as far as we know. Um, so we're moving into the second act after the Great Depression. How do they survive it? Do they survive it? And then we go into World War II. And so I think, Kira, you put it in most fascinating terms. There are windows into the history, into history that you're seeing through the eyes of this one family and its wealth, which moves and affects the whole world. Um, do, would you speak to just some of that harm, yeah. that some of the global harm we were even discussing, just in general? Yeah, I think that you know, for the the Lehman Brothers, I mean, they're quite they're, they're quite smart. <laughs> they're very crafty. You know, they're pretty astute business people, um, and the way that they are always constantly trying to get ahead um, of these uh, crises is to think of new ways to generate their wealth, and th those new ways tend to be to invest in systems um, that are going to quite literally. Um, oppress others. And so, you know, we we know um, they invest in all types of things, yeah, railroads, canals, but then they start investing in movies. Um, they invest in one movie in partic particular, which is um, uh, King Kong. Um, and I think that we can talk all about the racial imagery um, that is embedded um, in that film and kind of the, de the depiction of a black brute. And then we can bring it all the way up to today where LeBron James um, is on a cover of, a, is it Vanity Fair with a, with a model, is it Giselle, um, kind of in a King Kong stance. Um, and so I think that those are some of the ways that, you know, they're looking at how do they stay ahead of the times? How do they keep building their wealth? And then it just so happens, which, you know, I think it's fascinating that what they invest in uh, tend to have these uh, very important, you know, uh, racial connotations today. And I don't think that that is, um, you know, I don't think that that's just by chance. There was a point they were considering investing in housing, yeah. housing for workers to help support the workers. And that was the point where we move into the canal, where Philip Lehman says he's going to bridge oceans. And I'm thinking, is he maritime ships? And then he says the Panama Canal, which historical context. Um, Panama was in, made independent uh, through uh, Roosevelt and his big stick uh, in so many terms as in like Panama was part of Colombia. It benefited the United States that Panama become independent. A year after our independence, the United States was there because France couldn't do it. France was dying of uh, malaria, dysentery, uh, mosquitoes. Um, the French were being killed by mosquitoes. The U.S. builds the canal and is essentially makes a contract for uh, ever uh, to be occupying my country. So until Jimmy Carter. And Jimmy Carter said until 1999. Um, the U.S. also placed, uh, essentially trained a dictator named Manuel Noriega in power. Um, he was taken out by the United States because it didn't benefit Bush Sr. to have what they called at the time a dictator in his back pocket. I was four. That was in 1989. And then I was there in 1999 when the canal was returned. So many would say that Panama is only actually 23 years old because we've only not been occupied for 23 years. Um, so thus, I did not know Lehman Money went to building the canal. Um, and the canal was mostly built by West Indians, uh, which then influenced the culture of my country altogether. What are the other, who built the railroads? Yeah, um, I think that, you know, when we think about the history of, you know, Asian Americans who are um, often Japanese Americans who are um, building, you know, the railroads, um, and we know kind of how that history plays out and how people are forced to endure extremely brutal and unfair labor um, practices. And so again, you know, I think this is the thing about capitalism, right? Um, that capitalism allows 
um, it's kind of amorphous. Um, and it is, it is a part of everything. But when you really start to think about capitalism, you have to talk about racial capitalism. And, you know, um, there is a book that I love, um, Soul by Soul by uh, scholar Walter Johnson, when he's talking about, you know, slavery. And I think we can um, actually think about how that then plays out historically. He says, you know, it boils down to just a person with a price, you know, and when we're thinking about how they exploit, you know, labor globally, they're thinking about people with a price. Um, and um, yeah, I just wanted to kind of, you know, end there. And like we were talking about Panama and there's a great article um, by a scholar, Maya Doig Acuna, that's called The Most Caribbean Stories. That's where I learned um, about this history. So. Um, it was, uh, I've, we've been corrected, it was Vogue, not Vanity oh. Fair. Thank that you. That was the magazine cover. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, voice in the back. And uh, audience question. Have any of the members, other people ask similar questions, have any of the members of the Lehman family publicly commented on the play? And if so, did they have anything to say about it? I'm not aware of any comment from the Lehman family. No. No. no and actually, I mean, to compare, and uh, the Sackler family are the ones behind sort of uh, sort of the big pharma controversies around uh, opioids. And for the longest, uh, Nan Golden and other artists were trying to get the Sackler name off galleries, and they were throwing um, pill bottles all over galleries at the MoMA and the MFA, at the Met in New York, to, and nothing was really done. It was happening for years they were complaining about this until the sort of climax, the, the crescendo of the opioid crisis, where you're seeing people struggling so much with addiction and finally, the Sackler name's been taken off a lot of galleries. So it gets into the question of, uh, of wealth washing, right? How do, you, how do you launder your money? How do you wash your money to, in such a way that it's not associated with things that you're not proud of? Which in the play, you notice that at some point the Lehmans go, it's not cotton, it's coffee. And then, it's, then there's a pivot. And, and that's, that's over decades, right? Uh, oh, good. Um, thank you, everybody, for participating. Uh, I felt the cost of capitalism was depicted through a white lens. Uh, Dr. Kiera, I would like to know your opinion on this. Um, not doctor just yet. Soon, a few soon. months. Very, very um, soon. But I'm going to take very that. Soon. I'm going to take that, you know? Um, yeah, I mean, it is, it is, it is through their um, accumulation of wealth. Um, and it's through their eyes. And, you know, I think your point about it's not cotton, which they call Alabama gold. Very interesting, you know? Um, and then they say it's coffee, then it's not coffee. It's um, tobacco, then it's not tobacco. It's movies, then it's not movies. It's railroads, then it's canals, then it's housing. Then it's, then it's weapons. It's, yeah, then it's weapons, mm -hmm. then it's credit. Um, and so, yeah. Um, I was. Well, I just wondered, I mean, this is. A play is not necessarily the, the right forum, the right genre to consider what historians sometimes have to consider, which are alternatives. So I suggested earlier, as, as one example, that there was really no alternative for even the most well-meaning, most courageous, most anti-racist white in the antebellum South to really do anything about slavery. It was only, of course, the, the bloodshed of the Civil War that basically ended that. So I guess the, the question that the play can't answer, and that it seems to me is the lingering problem of what this program is called in terms of the cost of capitalism, is is there any way to even imagine what alternatives would be? Or to put it more directly, is there any way of imagining any capitalist enterprise, any sort of financial system that does not in some way implicate um, uh, racism does not in some way implicate tremendous cruelty, so that even in, in countries where there isn't a so-called racial problem, like the way in the Industrial Revolution begins in places like England and Belgium, you have extraordinary uh, horrors in terms of dealing with that, which had nothing to do with race. And if you imagine an alternative system to capitalism, and the extreme example would be the Soviet Union in the 20th century, which industrializes at a tremendous pace, you could argue the cost is even greater. So uh, the, Lehman, the Lehman trilogy is not probably the way to address that. And if I may so suggest, a forum like this is not adequate to do justice to that issue. 
but at least it's something that at least ought to be raised. Um, there's a question for you uh, that you mentioned you don't think that the play is anti-Semitic, and could you speak on more on why it is or it isn't? Tricky question. <laughs> The play is not anti-Semitic because, as I understand it, it basically follows more or less um, historical accuracy. So I would not want any, any group of people, any individuals, by dint of their race, their religion, their ancestry, their gender, whatever, I would not any, want anybody to be excluded from dramatic scrutiny merely because that group may have been historically oppressed. So for that reason, because it's roughly, these are not invented people, as Ikera, of course, rightly emphasizes. These are people who did things and, and bear at least some historical responsibility for them. I, I don't see the play as anti-Semitic. Mm -hmm. um, along these lines, so another question. Um, isn't the indictment of the Lehmans for relying on exploited labor a critique of capitalism in general? Sure. Is there anything unusual about their involvement? Either of you. Well, I, <laughs> there, there, there's nothing unusual about it at all. Yeah. Uh, in other words, it, it's historical circumstance. And again, the extraordinary pathos of people who love America because of what they're able to do with freedom that they would not have had uh, across the Atlantic. And then not, in my opinion, from what I can tell, not realizing the price that is paid by others. So in that sense, one might say that... Um, uh, it certainly fits that particular pattern, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, go beyond that. Um, I think that they, you know, they understand the price that is paid for others because that is the way that they are able to ascend, right? That they buy into whiteness in many ways. Um, and I think that that, for me, um, is, is a point that I do want to stress. Um, but I, I also think that there, you know, there are other interesting, you know, moments in the play in which, you know, not only do like black people become narrative tools, but also women. Um, and I think that there's a way in which, you know, we see, you know, you know, one of the brothers, you know, when he's like trying to find a wife, think about who can fit the perfect, you know, model for him that's going to help support his life. And I think if we think about how they're investing in their different industries, they're thinking about the model that's going to best support their life. Um, this is interesting. I find it sad and common that people fleeing oppression then participate in oppressing others. What are ways you would like to see this shown in the play since it's erased? And Charles, if you want to... Yeah, I, uh, uh, Dr. Whitfield, I don't know if you would talk about, I, I thought the point you were making about, um, uh, you make in the program for the play about um, Jewish teachings about oppression and slavery and the, the, um, the ways in which the Lehmans do not seem to struggle with that are interesting to you. Yeah, I mean, uh, whether there was any crisis of conscience if they celebrated a Seder, uh, the emancipation from slavery in Egypt, we have no way of knowing, of course. But that would have been, of course, a kind of pressure point if they indeed celebrated Passover, how they would um, reconcile that exaltation, that celebration with what was going on all around them and to which they contributed. But I, it's not a surprise that people do not live up to uh, their own religious teachings. And uh, I'm not going to shock anybody in this audience <laughs> in saying that. But uh, it's also very important that there at least is that tradition in Judaism that would at least offer a kind of uh, moral challenge if it were, as Kiara keeps saying, if it were in fact addressed. And it's, it's really not. Um, another question for Dr. Singleton. I'm going to get used to saying that. Can you talk more about what abolitionist struggle looked like at the time that the, uh, that the Lehman Brothers made other choices? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I mean, this is uh, 19th century, um, you know, so there is a hotbed of abolitionist um, activity um, throughout, um, you know, throughout the throughout the country. And I think that, you know, particularly when they moved to New York, I mean, 
what better site to think about that happening um, than there. And so we know that there are black um, abolitionists, white abolitionists going throughout the country and also to places like England um, teaching about the horrors of slavery. And so it is um, very likely that that rhetoric um, was circulating um, around the Lehmans. It's impossible for it to not have been actually. Um, And so, um, yeah, there's there's a ton of... um, abolitionist activity. There's a ton of thinking about um, ending slavery, fighting for the end of slavery. Um, and we have some very famous, prominent abolitionists, um, Frederick Douglass, you know, um, just to name one, um, who's not only, you know, giving speeches in New York, but giving speeches here in Massachusetts, um, giving speeches um, in other places and also globally as well. But he's not, he's not giving speeches in Charleston. He's not doing it in Richmond. I mean, abolitionism is not a, is not a Southern phenomenon. And the, the handful of white Southerners, like the Grimke sisters in Charleston, are forced to leave. I mean, abolitionism is basically blocked, prevented by every imaginable way, way by the slave owners who uh, run the South in this period. And, and in the North, it's... it's, it's um, in various ways unpopular. There are a number of abolitionists who were killed. Wendell Phillips uh, has a rope around his waist when uh, through the streets of Boston by a mob. Uh, abolitionism was struggling, certainly in the 1840s and well into the 1850s. And only with the Civil War was there the realization that the only way that militarily the Union could be preserved and uh, the war won was by adopting the abolitionist cause, but that came late, and Lincoln is famously slow in adopting the realization that emancipation was crucial to a military victory. Lincoln also just wanted to send everybody back. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I also want to be very clear that when we're talking about abolitionists, the biggest abolitionists are enslaved people themselves. And they are quite literally um, self emancipating. Um, they are, their slave narratives are circulating. Um, the, while it's interesting to think about not a major abolitionist movement in the South, what's really hard for me to to contend with that is that abolitionist literature is moving all throughout the South, actually. Um, enslaved people um, have uh, abolitionist uh, uh, print, printouts in their slave cabins. And so I don't want to say that it doesn't reach the South. I think if we're talking about the ways in which white people are engaging in abolition, then yeah, maybe. But black people, you know, have always been abolitionists um, as long as slavery has existed, actually. So. Mm-hmm. Um, any contemporary connections you see to what Cristal Aguera aptly referred to as Lehman Brothers wealth washing? There's a lot. <laughs> any that come to mind? Sure, no. Yeah. I mean, it happens all the time. It's sort of just, I think you have to watch history sort of turn. And then what becomes unpopular? You know, where are you investing? Um, at some point in the play, towards the end, when the Lehman's, it's no longer a Lehman running the company, they're involved in trading. And the trader uh, is sort of behind the scenes doing the what he calls dirty work. And then there's, uh, he's Hungarian, I believe, a Hungarian immigrant. But Oops. there is sort of the, the, the face of the company is this sort of Greek educated man. And so there's always this question of like, when you have that much money, is it all clean? Um, you know, we have about four minutes, but I, I wonder if that's something we sort of end on, you know, and do you need that much money? Does anyone really need that much money? Is, is the ultimate goal of capitalism, you know, is the immigrant, is the American dream, is the mythology of the American dream ultimately to achieve the level of success that the Lehman Brothers did? You know, is that what everybody's looking for? Is that, is that what everybody wants? You know, I say this as a reporter who was at the border in the fall talking to, you know, Venezuelan migrants who had walked most of Central America on foot, coming to a country that claims a lot of things. Um, many of them are not true. Um, and so thus the, the mythologies that we are sort of very concerned about children reading about in books, you know, seemingly this country is very concerned about learning about its skeletons. We're in a moment of, of, of very concerning histories coming to the surface that have always existed. And suddenly people are finding out about them and 
God forbid. Uh, final thoughts? Uh, yeah, just picking up on that, it seems to me the play probably, as I say, hand, my handicap not having seen it, but the play seems to be leaving that question unanswered um, as to whether all this extraordinary intensity in the accumulation of wealth, whether that um, has any ultimate uh, satisfaction in terms of happiness, in terms of moral assurance, uh, in terms of awareness of uh, being helpful to society. The play doesn't seem to me to uh, even raise that question, much less answer it. Uh, it's, a, it's a story of a saga of a family. It's ups and ultimately it's down. Without, it seems to me, offering a, uh, uh, an actual voice of criticism of it. It prefers to describe it. It's important for historical reasons, maybe also important for dramatic reasons, but it doesn't, it doesn't allow a kind of final punch by which it says all this is worthless. Uh, there are all sorts of works. The Great Gatsby is the one that comes immediately to mind that shows that all this effort at wealth is meaningless and uh, self-destructive. I don't think the Lehman Trilogy is in that category. Hmm. Kira? Um. I think it, you know, it is, it is, I, you know, I, I, I agree to a certain extent, actually. And, you know, one of the things, though, I think is very fascinating is that it tells us to follow the money, essentially, you know, and if you follow the money, then you're going to find um, where the money is coming from. And so I wanted to do a, one quick thing, like you mentioned the Grimkeys. Um, so Carrie Greenwich's new book on the Grimkeys show that they're able to do their abolitionist work because they're being funded from, you know, their family who are enslavers, right? So if you, you, you follow that money, oh, surprise, surprise, it links back, you know. Um, there's a really amazing work being done around the churches here in Massachusetts, um, one by a scholar, a scholar named Abed Alibi, and talks about, you know, um, First Church of Roxbury and how, you know, enslaved people are in that parish. And if you look at Old North and King's Chapel and lots of other places, Surprise, surprise, they're there too. And then we can even, you know, bring it to the fact that um, the Lehman Brothers, like the, the bank crashes 2008. Well, we're on the on onset of the financial housing crisis. There is a cost to that. You know, the people who are most impacted by that, black and brown communities who have never recovered. And it's not lost on me that we are in Massachusetts, where the average net worth of a black family is $8 compared to the average net worth of a white family. That's 250000 And that has everything to do with property, um, you know, in many regards. And so I think when you follow the money and you follow the choices, while this is a, a work of historical fiction, Art also reflects the times, you know, in which we are in. And I think it's doing that for all of those periods, even when there are silences. But it helps us understand, you know, today that those silences actually are not silent, are not silent for certain communities. Um, bootstraps don't exist, mm -hmm. generally speaking. The idea that people pulled any bootstraps up, did not have a leg up already, did not have gener generational wealth, property, um, just were given immediate access. I love, I'll end it on this. Uh, it, my favorite character was the potato. When you watch it, you'll know. And the potato had this smile that would just convince everybody to do his bidding. Um, so historical fiction, fiction, we don't know if Meyer Lehman was like this, but you know, he happened to be able to make his way through very easily, convincing governors to do what he wanted, while you know, also enslaving other people, and then using that as a ladder. You know, and so yes, three generations later, these, these families are still rich. So what would have happened if other people had had, you know, the same gumption, the same opportunities, not through enslavement, but just through economic means? You know, GI bills, not redlined. You know, what would this country look like if there was a more equitable path to success in 2023, going back a century? It's food for thought. And thank you. I'll bring Amy up. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Cristela, for leading this conversation. Steve Whitfield, Kiara Singleton, the new artistic director at the Huntington, Charles Hoglin. 
and Oz Pereira and Temple Gill for bringing this conversation. Thank you all for coming. I'm so looking forward to seeing the play. Get your umbrellas. It is pouring out there. Thank you for coming. <laughs>